So what I'd like to do with you guys today is talk to you about an issue that I think is really cool. Now, I have a bit of a weird sense of cool, but I was invited about six months ago to go talk to a group of lab people in the States, this very big, large lab group, and they said, feel free to talk about whatever you want. Tell us what we're doing right, tell us what we're doing wrong, and that's a golden opportunity for me to dig into a bunch of stuff and try and put it into context. And I, and I learned a lot of stuff, and I think, I, hopefully I can make it interesting and you'll learn a bunch of stuff that I bet you did not know about lab tests. So, as anyone who gives a talk, you should know about the conflicts of interest. My entire uh, salary comes through the UBC Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences. I also do some legal work and educational work, kind of what I'm doing now. And uh, I've received no honorarium or research money from the drug industry in the last 25 or so years. Not that there's anything wrong with it. And I do, uh, I make some iPhone and iPad apps, and a number of you know that I do a weekly podcast, and I know a number of you listen to that, and I very, very much appreciate the fact that you guys are interested in some of the stuff that myself and my colleagues do. The title for my talk came from this clip from The Simpsons, and uh, it's, it's, alcohol is wonderful, but it can be a problem, just like lab tests, and I'll play this for you. To alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. So, with lab tests, they are extremely useful, but they are a huge cause of problems in, in, in a lot of things that we do in medicine. And what I want to do is sort of work you through that story. As you know, a number of you, a number, I do these music videos. And if you're ever interested in the concept of overdiagnosis, which is where I'm going to be focusing on a little bit, this is one done to uh, Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water. And I'll just play a short clip of it. And if you ever wanted to know about overdiagnosis, just listen to this, and then you don't have to listen to anything else. And it goes like this. Just been scared. Those fears with them. Incidental. And you should just be impressed for no other reason that I could get the word incidental oma into a rock <laughs> song. Just you should be impressed by that. And so it's about the, the problem with these lab tests is the concept of overdiagnosis. And overdiagnosis is such a problem, there is a conference called the Overdiagnosis Conference. And I attended on a fairly regular basis, and it's really interesting to talk about this. So this is, as I'm sure you can clearly see, is a list of some of the diagnoses that we make with lab tests. We think probably, and I'm sure you can, it's, there's, the, the number could be up for debate, but about two thirds to three fourths of the information used for making medical decisions is about has to do with lab tests and what we do with them. So lab tests are a really important part of medical practice. And a colleague of mine once told me, and we talked about it, if you're not sick, you just haven't had enough tests. And that's, the, you'll see at the end of this, you're, if you do enough tests, you will find a problem. Uh, this, you know, as you know, it's very important to know your serum rhubarb. And uh, if you haven't been measuring it in your patients, I think you're missing something. And when we look at the number of, uh, articles in the, in the medical literature about overdiagnosis, and a lot of it, again, refers to the lab tests, it's sort of increased exponentially over the last number of years, and there's a lot of people writing about this issue, and I think you need to be very sensitive to this when you're, when you're taking care of patients. So, when that happens, we have this. Houston, we have a problem. Which I'm sure you know that movie, although it's really interesting, the people in the, they never actually said that. I did not know this is one of, I love myths. They, they, he said, Houston, we have a problem. That's not what they said. Can you just turn up the volume just a little bit? This is actually what they said. Hey, uh, Houston, we've had a problem here. Just subtly different. They decided to reword it because it sounded more uh, uh, exciting to use it the way they did it. So I just thought I'd let you know that no one actually ever said that, <laughs> except in the movie. So we have a problem. So the overdiagnosis problem. It's multifactorial. Everyone is involved in it. All of us, clinicians, technicians, patients, we all play a role in this concept. In other words, it's a human issue. And uh, this is not just the lab's fault, but they are a major player in this. And they are fully aware of it, and they believe that you guys are supposed to figure it out. And, uh, but also, as you probably know, if you've listened to stuff that I do, clinical guidelines are also a major problem where we have these defined arbitrary th thresholds that are not based usually on any really good science. 
And then the media blows things up, and we are all influenced by the media. I'm influenced by the media, and so are you guys. And as you know, uh, at least in the States, and I, I know it's here available in Canada, in, at least in the States they're saying that there's a new rule grants patients direct access to lab results. So patients now have direct access. I'm sure for those of you who, uh, if you ever get anything medically done, you, you can get access to your lab results. Your family members can get abs access to lab results. And uh, here's the problem is it's typically the same report that goes to healthcare providers. That's one problem one. And many healthcare providers don't even appreciate the nuances of those tests uh, which I'm going to be talking about. So this is an example. You can see my eHealth. Uh, my mom was on here. This is uh, that's my mom with my daughter, who's now 12, but that's what she looked like then. And my mom has a medical condition for which she needs some lab tests on a somewhat regular basis. And when you go onto the site, you get this. You might as well give her this. <laughs> it's a comp it's hieroglyphics. It's hieroglyphics to me, let alone her. Or you may as well just open it up and have it speak Klingon. <laughs> Even though I get the concept of giving out these lab values, but you cannot provide it. This is, a, this is of no value. It, it's very tricky to use this because of the nuances associated with it. And when they color things as being good or bad, it creates angst around it. So what do we do with this? So this is just an example of some of the numbers that come up. And you can see some of them are purple, and then they're black, and so on and so forth. And I can tell you right now, none of those have changed. They, they, even though they have different colors sometimes, they are all the same for all intents and purposes because of the variability associated with me measurements and lab tests. And if you don't know that, you're going to make inappropriate decisions when it comes to healthcare. So this is a, a quote from a very famous person who said, for much in medicine, we knowingly sell preeminent precision, even though we all know in our heart of hearts we can only deliver educated estimates. And I think we have to be very conscious of that. And I believe most patients would be very understanding about this imprecision if we were just more open about it. And I think it's really important. But here's what's really important to know is, you just figured it out, right? <laughs> yeah. And we can't be precise about the imprecision. That's where it kind of gets us a little bit crazy. So just to put it into context, I'm speaking in general, and I do realize there are some exceptions to what I'm going to be saying. But this you know, covers 95% of most things that we're going to talk about. And I'm going to be presenting concepts to get you thinking in a way that's different. And I'll give you ballpark estimates, which is, again, all we can do in medicine. We are not very precise in medicine. So <clears throat> I'm sure a number of you are familiar with this movie. And here's the problem with faking precision. And I, I'm always a bit nervous putting this up because I know you're just going to watch this. <laughs> and it's just going to go on and on and on. So when you fake things, it creates a problem because we create a whole bunch of false beliefs. And I know you're not looking at, at these lines at all. You're still looking at, the, at her. But this is belief one. The good, uh, bad thresholds are relatively black and white. We think that these things are relatively black and white. And when the numbers change, we believe that those changes are real. Those are the beliefs that we have set up when we fake things. These beliefs can potentially lead to inappropriate feelings of fear, happiness, frustration, and confusion. And that's what I want to try to help you with and, and get you to stop doing that. Is she done? I think she is. Yeah, OK. <laughs> so this is, we have this problem both in patients and clinicians. So here are some of the sources of imprecision. We have lab error. We have analytic variation. And we have biologic variation. And I'm going to go over each one of those and, again, hopefully put it into a context that's of value. So, when we talk about actual lab errors, where they get the things like the wrong name on the thing, they, they switch samples, they, there is a, 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 an error with the actual machine that's doing it. What's really good, and this is even 10-year-old data, so it's probably better, lab error is 0.3% of the problem. So the issue is not lab error. So when you get a test back and you go, oh, it could be an error, it's probably not an error. And there are some things that are errors, but in general, they are reasonably well done. And in fact, this is even better than, uh, so they do a pretty good job of that. Dispensing errors are 1% to 2%. So that's, that's sort of putting it into context. So lab error is not the issue that I'm talking about. What I'm going to be talking about, and this is why it's a bit of a minefield when we look at this, is talking about how we measure things. And this, this actually applies to many, many things in medicine. And we're going to talk a little bit about population-based reference intervals. And I know this is very technical, but I'm hoping to make it as 
simple as possible. To, uh, and not so that you guys can understand, I just contextually we need to understand this. And then there's analytic variation, biologic variation, and a thing called reference change values. And I'll work you through what that, what that means. So, whenever you see a lab report back, it's based on a population-based, ref, what they call a population-based reference interval. What that means is, is you have these uh, healthy, when it, you just go measure, and everything is a bell-shaped curve in, 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 in medicine and, and basically life. So you measure a whole bunch of people and that are healthy. So we don't, all of these lab results are not based on unhealthy, they are healthy people. So, uh, and when you uh, measure hundreds and hundreds of people with a certain lab test, a bunch of people are on uh, low, the low side and high side, and we call those abnormal, <coughs> even though none of them are in abnormal people. They're in healthy people. So that's where we get these intervals that are on the lab report. And so lab reports result exact numbers, but depending on the lab test that we're gonna talk, we, that you're talking about, the true result can be plus or minus one to two percent, or upwards of 20 to 30 percent plus or minus, or more. And I think you really need to know of the lab test that you order or look at, you need to know what's going on. And because of the fact that we are working on a bell-shaped curve, if you do a whole bunch of tests, by chance alone, you will find ones that go at the extremes. Even, in, if, the person, even if the patient has absolutely no illness. So if you order, say, 15 tests in an otherwise healthy person, there's a 50-50 chance one of those will be abnormal. And then that creates a problem. And by abnormal, I just mean outside of that reference interval. So the more and more tests you do, the greater chance you have of having something abnormal, abnormal or outside that range, and then you got, feel like you gotta do something about it because it's outside that range. So we get into this, and I don't know if this is an old reference to uh, uh, something. Do you know what that's a reference to? Yeah, John McEnroe. You cannot be serious! That ball was on the line. Shot flew up. It was clearly in. So in tennis, it's really important where that line is. Because it's in or it's out. Lab values don't work that way. It's not in or out. And that's a really important concept to understand. And so the whole reason we do tests is that we're typically trying to figure out now, what is the test result now, and has it changed from what the previous result was? That's the reason we do tests, primarily. So let's look a little bit at how we do measurements. So, this is a, one kid measuring the height of another kid. You can see quite easily, there's a whole bunch of things that could affect this test. There's analytic variation, and, and, and by the way, just every measurement of anything will be different, right? It doesn't matter what you do. If I, if I brought someone up here and I measure them, every time I measure them, if I have a little six-foot ruler, they're going to be different height. And all of you can go, I don't think they're changing height. In our head, we can go, mm, probably not. But when it comes to lab tests, we don't have that same sort of filter. So every measurement will be different, and it's going to be different because of two things. Analytic variability, and that analytic variability has to do with the actual test. So in this case, it has to do with how good that kid is with the ruler, how good that ruler is, is it twisted, has he bent it at the bottom, is he getting it to the top of that person's head? Those are the analytic variations that are associated with all lab tests. Then we have the biologic variability, where we have this girl whose height in the next minute does not change. But if she's wearing shoes, or she slouches, or she decides to do this, that's the biologic variation which will change her height, the measurement will change, but her height has not changed. So those are the two main things in any lab test that you see a variation, analytic and biologic variability. To deal with those issues, there is a thing in laboratory measurement called reference change values, and they're called RCVs. And, and it's basically a tool for assessment of figuring out if one test is different than another. And by the way, at the end, I'm going to get to some tables that you can use on a day-to-day -day basis, I hope, and a solution to the problem. So I'm just going to create, show you the problem, and then we'll work our way, way through it. So there's a whole bunch of sort of statistics that are associated with serial results that help us deal with this imprecision that we have. 
And there's things with like coefficients of variation and, and so on. And what I can sort of show you, I think, is with every test, there is a bell-shaped curve. So if you do a test of, say, an LDL, there is a bell-shaped curve around that. If you do then a second test, e this is the exact result right there and right there, but around that is a variation. But when you do that, there is a statistical way of going, is the differences between these two tests statistically large enough that it, we think it's probably different? And this is a very uh, complicated formula at the bottom, but don't worry about it. Just the, it just makes everyone look much smarter when we do these sort of things. But it, so the issue is, you've got two tests. Are they different? So there is a minimum difference between two tests for where you can say, we're pretty comfortable that we don't, th that we, th this is not just analytic or biologic variation. OK? So let's work on that a little bit. So in this formula that we use, a thing called analytic and, and uh, biologic variation, there's a way of calculating that. You don't have to worry about any of that. You just need to know how big the variability is. So remember, analytic variation, that's a problem with the ruler. Biologic is that little kid moving up and down and uh, slouching and things like that. Most lab tests, we didn't have to worry about lab error. In this case, if analytic variability, that's the problem with the test, most lab people figure if it's less than one half the average within subject variation, they're very comfortable with it. And I can tell you right now, almost all tests are that good. So the analytic variation is actually not very much at all. What the problem is, is the biologic variation. So we're good with this. So the testing is good. There's not lab errors. So when we have relatively small variation in the analytic technique, it, the entire variation is secondary to the biologic variation. And that's the biologic variation that we all have in, in, in us. So it's, it's all about biologic variation. So you can forget everything else about analytic and forget, forget about the lab error. I just want you to concentrate on the fact that there is this biological variation. So we have a problem, which you know we didn't say, but we still do have a problem. So, and here's another thing where it even gets trickier. There is a statistical way of doing this, and I am not a big fan of p-values. And I'm, some of you are going, oh my god, he's talking about p-values. <laughs> Don't worry about it, but the issue is just to realize that these, again, are not black and white. Remember the imprecision we were talking about? Some people have said that, uh, you know, p-values are uh, science's dirtiest secret. The scientific method of testing hypotheses by statistical analysis stands on a flimsy foundation. Numerous deep flaws in this significant testing. Uh, they have more flaws than Facebook's privacy policies. <laughs> and that is somewhat true, but we need to understand some of these things, and whether you use a 95% confidence interval or a 99%, it, I, those are de who, nobody really knows. So we have these reference change values. So you have two lab tests, and, and I'm going to show you what, how big a change you need in a lab test to be comfortable that it's changed. Just because you can say that something's changed doesn't mean it's changed by the amount that it did change. Does that make sense? So if one test comes back at one and it's two, that difference is one. If you did a statistical test on it to show that that's probably statistically different, it doesn't mean it changed by one. By one. It just means it changed in that direction, probably. So we cannot be sure of the magnitude of that difference when we see, when we're comfortable that there has been a change. So. We believe the two results are different, but we don't. We can't quantify that with much precision. Some people will say, well, what if we repeat these measures? Well, most of the time, you don't repeat these lab tests. But even if you, if you repeat them four times, so if you did an LDL four times before and four times after, all it does is get rid of about half the biologic variation. I know almost none of you know, and this is none of, none of us health professionals do. OK, we're going to measure your LDL four times, and then we'll see what it is, and then we'll average it, and then we'll do something, and then we'll average it four times again, and then we'll compare those two. You don't do that. You do one before and one after. So lab error, a little bit. Analytic variation, a little bit more. Biologic variation. So here's the problem. 
The enemy is us. It's our inherent biologic variation. And there is, this is not fixable. It is knowable. And when you know about it, it really helps you think about what you should be doing with lab tests, I hope. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a variety of different ones and show you the problem. And when I sh mean I show you the problem, it actually is enlightening when you understand the variation. So bone density is a really good example of one of the problems with lab tests. I know it's not a blood test, but there is that sort of, uh, and in fact, much of this variation is not biologic. It's actually more analytic, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So if you read the guidelines, they will say, you obtain a, a baseline DEXA and repeat it every one to two years and continue with follow-up and blah, 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 blah. Because it sounds right. And why was it one to two years? I don't know. It just seemed like better than three to four years. <laughs> this stuff is made up. So this is the very, this is what happens when you measure a whole bunch of people's, this is not an individual, this is a whole bunch of people's uh, bone density, oops, sorry about that, bone density tests. And there's a, there's a bell-shaped curve. And when you get to the lower density, this is osteopenia, then osteoporosis. And these are the T-scores that get 0, minus 1, minus 2. And that, that's where you'd be defined as having osteoporosis. And it doesn't matter what these, this could be bushels per acre. Who cares what it's <laughs> milligrams per centimeter squared. I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it does matter to someone, but none of us. So this is the sort of, this is the bell-shaped curve for everybody who's otherwise relatively healthy. And we have these break points for it. So, Average bone loss per year is about 0.6% per year. So as we get older, we lose uh, uh, bone density. So it's about 0.6%. When we give treatments, whether they be drugs or non-drugs, we see about a change in bone density of about 5% over three years. Okay? So half a percent per year, about 5% if we do a treatment that actually does stuff to bone density. I don't know if you just saw what happened there. See this right here? That little thing there? That's 5%. So you don't see much of a, a change in this. And then I want you to watch very closely to that too. Because the imprecision or the precision issues is about 2 to 3% in bone density. So look where that brown is. That's the imprecision. So you cannot pick up those changes with a test that's not, and this is a very good test. But because we see small changes, so if it's plus or minus 2 to 3% and annually your bone density changes about 0.5%, you can't pick that up at all. It's impossible to pick that change up. And so for that reason, repeat bone density tests every year are absolutely a waste of time. But the cool thing about it is they'll change. But not because it's just that, this is, in this case, it's just that uh, analytic variation. So I, I thought I'd just make it a bit bigger so you could see it, because that's how small these changes are. And, and you can see that even if you, with all the greatest therapy in the world, you'll never take someone who's got osteoporosis and put them into a normal range. That just cannot happen. So we've published some of this, and other people have published this, where they said, if you repeat bone density in the first three years after starting treatment with the bisphosphonate, it's unnecessarily and potentially confusing. And it is, because you don't know what to do with it. Because the, it will change, and it'll go up and down, and if it, goes, if it gets better, you'll all go, well done to everybody, and we'll all be happy. But you can't because it's not because of the treatment. It's because of the variation in the test. And interestingly, just the most recent guideline came out, and they actually said this, and it's because of this problem, but this is the first guideline that I've ever seen that it says, stop doing it. Repeating these bone density tests are really of no value. And they are, they're not of value. But it's really difficult because a person, you d make a diagnosis on the basis of a bone density, then you give a treatment, you want to know what's happened to the bone density. Yeah, it's nice to know, but you can't know. So sh stop it. You, it's, it's really of no value. Some people have said, you know, if, if a person's bone density is a certain thing, just keep remeasuring it. And when it becomes what you want it to be, stop measuring which is not good medicine, just in case you're wondering. So another s people have also said the same thing. Even repeating it even every eight years is a waste of time. So you can make an argument to do a reasonably, in a one, one bone density in a lifetime. And you can use that for risk assessment, like I, we 
talked about I hope it's some of the stuff that we've done, and that's it. That's all you need. And in fact, if a person would not want treatment anyway, don't do the test. Just say, yeah, you're getting older. Your bones are getting thinner. Here's what you should do. Yeah, but I want to know. No, you don't. <laughs> so that's an example of bone density. Now, this is an example where it's the biologic variation that's primarily the issue here. So, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines for 2016 said the following. In individuals with a modified Framingham risk score of 5 to 9%, yearly monitoring could be used to evaluate change in risk. It could be, but don't do it. And even the American guidelines said this, is that lipid status should be reassessed six weeks after therapy initiation, and again at six-week intervals until a treatment goal is achieved. This is insanity making. <laughs> it makes a whole bunch of assumptions that I think are probably flawed, but they make kind of sense. Well, you've got a high number, so we're going to give you something to lower it, and we should see if it's lowered. If you give a statin, if you would do that, it's lowered. There is, it's like a 99% chance that if you take a statin, your cholesterol will come down. So if it didn't come down, probably the problem with the test. So it's, if you follow the guidelines, it seems reasonable, but it's kind of the wrong thing to do. So this is a sort of variation in the measurement. Is it a true change or not? So the variation in total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol is about this, and it's actually a little bit more when I, I'll give you some numbers to use as we go through this. With LDL, as an example, it's sort of a plus and minus 0.5 millimoles per liter. It's actually a little bit more of that when you look at everything, but in, this, in their example, it was about 0.5. So what does that really mean? Well, as we get older, our cholesterol does tend to increase, but again, it increases about 0.5 to 1%. Well, that's a plus or minus probably somewhere around 7 to 10%. So you literally cannot pick it up. So doing year, yearly cholesterol is an absolute waste of time because you cannot pick these things changes up. And uh, after initial change, only measure every three to five years, and even that is a bit of an, ex uh, an, uh, an exaggeration of what you need to do. But let me show you where we get into troubles with this. And I'm going to use statins as an example, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of statins. I'm not a huge not fan of statins. I just believe in whatever the evidence can help us with that. So this is an example of how big a change you get with different doses of a statin. That is the LDL reduction that you see with these different statins using the lowest dose that we have available. So that's a 10 millimeter change. And you can see that the changes in cholesterol are somewhere, let's say, around 30% ballpark, depending on which statin that you use. That's from 10 milligrams. For those of you who ever listened to anything that we've done, remember I've told you that low doses are really the way to go for most things, like really low doses? Here's a great example why even though I know I'm talking about LDL levels and I'm not a big fan of LDL levels, but this is just one example. So if you double the dose, this is what, how much more you get of your LDL lowering. If you quadruple it, if you eight, oop, quin, what, eight times, I don't even know what, octuple it. <laughs> I don't know what that is. That's what you get. So. One of the recommendations often has is been, if you've got a person on a low-dose cholesterol and their, their, num their number is not what you want it to be, you increase the dose to a bigger number. You can see these changes. These changes in cholesterol, when you use eight times the dose, you're seeing about a 5% change in cholesterol. The test can't pick it up. So you're kind of screwed. So a lot of people are thinking with cholesterol things, it's, you know, just, uh, just you uh, give them a statin and leave them alone. Kind of even with blood pressure, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Give them a blood pressure medication or give them a treatment for blood pressure and leave them alone. So, and this is just an example. So you get 100% of the treatment of the, of the LDL benefit from 80 milligrams of a torvastatin. You get 95% when you cut it in half. You get 85% when you cut it in half again. And you still get 75% when you get cut it in half again. And you can tell we're not even down at the fives and the ones and the so ones, right? And most drugs are like this. The dosing, you don't get much better or more effect when you double or triple or octuple the dose. So here's an example. A person comes in and you measure their LDL and it's four. We've already said it's plus or minus about 0.5 units here. 
on the, you know, plus or minus about 0.5 millimoles per liter. So that's, so when you measure it, you, when you say, when you measure it at four, you cannot tell them really it's four. You can say it's somewhere between three and a half and four and a half. Then if you were to give them a statin, it lowers their cholesterol by about 30%. So you might be able to pick that difference up. You can see that plus and minus, they're not overlapping much. So it would, you could probably pick up the fact that that cholesterol has changed by 30% with the test that we have. But if you were then to increase the dose where it changes just a little bit more, you'll never pick it up. It's, so when you, whenever you increase the dose of a medication like this and then remeasure, it's like peeing into the ocean. It's a waste of time. It's too, it's too big of a problem. You cannot measure and notice that. And, uh, and again, a number of people who've looked at this and say repeat risk est estimation before eight to 10 years is not warranted. And I, that's very true. If you were to do a cholesterol, never do them every year. It's literally a waste of time because of that variation, the biologic variation. Okay, blood pressure. So blood pressure is not a lab test per se, but it's a measurement that you guys probably do on a fairly regular basis. So when you give treatments for blood pressure, and again, I'm focusing on medications, but the same thing applies to whether you do any sort of nutritional things, low salt, please don't use low salt. That's another thing. But when you do things and, and get people to try to lower their blood pressure doing other things, when you give a medication, on average, a medication will lower systolic blood pressure by about nine millimeters of mercury, on average. If you increase the dose, you get another little bit more, probably about around three millimeters of mercury increase. So when we're talking about treatment of high blood pressure, we typically do not want you to use, we just want you to use little doses of two or three medications, much better, if, if that's your focus on it, than one big dose. And hopefully you can get the benefit with fewer side effects. Here's what's interesting. Seasonal differences are that your average systolic drops by about eight millimeter, millimeters of mercury when it's warm. So that's about the amount that you might see with a drug. As we get older, systolic blood pressure goes up almost continually, and then diastolic goes up until you get to about age 60, and then it starts to drop off. On average, blood pressure increases about one millimeter, half to one millimeter mercury per year, just naturally. You can't pick that up. This is the sample size calculation that people have suggested you need to do. 40 office measurement before and after treatment to be reasonably confident, confident that a five millimeter change has occurred. That's something, eh? I bet you don't do 40 measurements like in a week. And I'm not suggesting you do this because one, the person would be there for, they'd have to live at your house. But this is an example of that variation. And we all, I think you appreciate blood pressure variation. It's pretty, you kind of know, you know, and people probably bring their, their thing, their Excel spreadsheets in saying, look at this is when I was outside walking, my blood pressure did this. And, and I, I love that variation. They go, I said, if it's not variable like that, you're in trouble. And so it's really tricky to pick it up. So you gotta, and this is a great way to explain to people that they need, should not be obsessed by those numbers. And in fact, some people say, if you don't see, if your blood pressure has not changed at least 10 over five in multiple measurements, you can't actually say it's changed. But we all do that. We, you know, a person comes in and their blood pressure is 145 systolic and they do whatever you tell them to do and they come back and the next time you measure it's 140. What do you do? Well done. Well done. Well, it has nothing to do with what they've done. But if, they, if you've got them to be more physically active, brilliant. If they're eating healthier food, brilliant. It's just don't need to measure it unless you're gonna do 40 plus and minus before and after. And so this is other people who've said this in British Journal of General Practice and the BMJ. A single careful blood pressure measurement taken a few months after the start of treatment is not useful for monitoring. I mean, it's really clear. People, know, we know this stuff. And it's again that biologic variation that really kind of screws us. Glucose, one of my lovely pet peeves is glucose. Let's look at the variation in that. This is what an A1C result really means. It's precisely imprecise. So we've got A1C. That's considered, an A1C of between five and six is considered normal. Hate the word normal, but that's what's considered normal. That's considered prediabetes, one of the 
things we should never allow anyone ever to say, pre-diabetes, because as soon as you say pre-diabetes, they go, diabetes. And then this is diabetes. That's the thresholds that we use, these arbitrary thresholds. If you were to measure an A1C and it came back at 6.3, see that arrow there? That is what the plus and minus is. So you can see, if it's 6.3, it could be probably as high as you know 6.8, 6.9, could be as low as 5. Point, what would that be? 5.7, 5.8. So if you would happen to measure an A1C of 6.3, it could mean they're normal or have prediabetes or diabetes. You don't know which one. That's a problem. When you have a test like that, that you, you're now going right the way from normal to diabetes. And again, these terms are based on arbitrary thresholds. Now, when we give a, a medication, you typically see about a 0.7% change in A1C. You can't barely pick that up. You might be able to, if you did many, many repeat measurements, you might be able to see that change, but it's really difficult. Now, if you have, and I'm sure you've seen patients, if they come in with an A1C of nine or 10, and they work hard and they do a whole bunch of things and their A1C a year later comes back and it's down at six, it's changed. And we should be comfortable knowing, we don't know it's really gone from 10 to six, it could have gone from nine to seven or whatever. That, you can be comfortable that there's been a change. But when we're talking about subtle changes, you, you really can't pick those up. And here's another season, the seasonal variation in A1C is it's higher in the winter by anywhere from 0.2 to 0.5%, which is a fair change when we're looking at how relatively small a change you can get with medications. So. We still have. Houston, we have a problem. We still have a problem. And I promise you, I'm going to get to the solution. So, another important issue when it comes to glucose, cholesterol, blood pressure, and bone density is these are rarely measures of any disease. In fact, they are not diseases, they are simply risk factors. And we should always present those lab values, not in the context of you have blood pressure problems or diabetes problems, but what is your chance of cardiovascular disease? And I'm sure a number of you have used these calculators. This is the one that we put out to try and get you to help make those discussions. And you don't need any more than this. It'll tell you exactly ballpark what the person's risk might be and what would happen if you make changes. And so we really encourage you to do that. Now, there's also a uh, thing with vitamin D. Vitamin D is, if you want to see a, a biologic variation in, a, in any measurement, it doesn't get much bigger than vitamin D. So the cost of vitamin D measurements used to be around 50 to 60 bucks. I've never seen a, tr a test that cost way more than the treatment. And vitamin D is relatively inexpensive, but here's where it gets tricky, is that a number of years ago, a bunch of provinces were struggling with how many vitamin D measurements people were making. And it actually, a number of years ago, became the most ordered hormone assay in the United States, and it's pretty much a waste of time. And, but fortunately, you can do it at home. So what is the evidence to test serum vitamin D levels and, and what threshold should we use? And when we looked at this, they, we just said routine testing of vitamin D levels are unnecessary because they don't really, the, the, the thresholds that we use are again relatively arbitrarily made up. And the large variability in the test limits, it really makes it very difficult to use that. And so the variability in measurements, uh, 15, 20 years ago, the lab to lab variation was 38%. That's a pretty big variation. It's gotten better probably around, somewhere around probably 15% or so now. But with, with this amount of variation in uh, the, the, the test, anywhere from 15 to 20%, that, and that's just the, uh, that's the within patient, and then you add in the analytic variation, it gets even bigger. With those sorts of changes, if you were to give a vitamin D supplement, say 800 international units, on average that changes vitamin D levels by about 20 nanomoles per liter, you can't pick it up. The change is not big enough for you to pick it up. But if you repeat vitamin D, it will go up and down, it'll go up and down and up and down. But not, you're not picking it up because of the, the treatment. You're picking it up just the biologic variation. So that variation makes it very, very difficult to deal with. For that reason, vitamin D, testing uh, was banned pretty much. 
because it's a very relatively expensive test that is really of almost no value. Now, it may be value of using vitamin D and things like that, but I'm talking about the measurement of it. And so uh, you can only get it if they're, uh, when the patient is less than 19 years of age or the test is ordered by a specialist. If you really want it, someone else has to pay for it or the user has to pay for it. So now what? So I've given you some examples of where we're into problems. So now I'm going to try and give you some sort of solutions to some of these issues. So the obscure we see eventually, the completely obvious seems to take a lot longer. So I've tried to show you that these are completely obvious things when you sort of think about it. It's important to remember, this is not a fixable problem. It is just something that you can know and incorporate into your practice. So first of all, we have to be very honest here, and we have to embrace our nudity, or nudity, whatever the word it would be. I can't do the quintuple, octuple thing, and, and it doesn't matter. Anyway, so we have to embrace this. We have to be honest with our, other, our healthcare colleagues and our patients that we are not this good. We are ballpark, we're helping, we're on average a little bit. We don't know these things. So these are, and these are some other issues that I haven't even discussed. The biologic variations that I'm showing you are typically from populations, and they can actually vary from age to age. So we don't have the biologic variations for everybody, and so we are using some estimates. There is no evidence behind the population-based reference intervals. There's very little evidence. It's just you're outside the normal, whatever normal is. It doesn't mean you're sick. We talked about a little bit about arbitrary thresholds in guidelines, and there's a big debate about, and this is where it gets you don't really care and I don't really care, is it one-sided or two-sided statistical testing you should do? Like, who cares? You need to be familiar with the variation to help you put it into context. And not every lab value is actually normally distributed. Some of them have a Gaussian distribution. And I put this up just to make the lab people happy when I was giving the talk so that they, because they'll always, if I don't do this, they just ask these questions as if I didn't know about it. So I put those up. Uh, so I realized that, and it doesn't change the fundamental concepts of it. And then there's old concept of Bayesian approaches to when you have a pretest and a post-test, how it changes the probability. If you've ever talked about those sorts of things, I'd love to come back and talk to you about pre- and post-test possibilities, because it actually is a cool way to help you figure out what these tests mean. And then this whole point of care testing, where everyone can measure everything at home, is a major problem, because now you're talking about big analytic variation problems. And then there's this fear of changing and, and I hear, well, it's really difficult to get the labs to change the technology. And what about the legal ramifications if we tell them that we're not being precise? So here's what we should do. I think we should uh, openly explain and present lab, vali lab variability. I, I don't think there's any doubt that we should have those conversations. And it's not a difficult conversation to say when a number comes back, you know, I know that is the number, but it's probably plus or minus about this. I think most people get those sort of concepts. We should be openly discuss the potential black and white, uh, the potentially black and white things about the lab variability. Of course, we should talk about those things and say there's variation in these things. We should uh, stop using words like low, medium, and high and significant because those are terms that we kind of make up. And when you say high, I don't know what you're talking about, and vice versa. Whether or not you use a 95 or a 90 percent or an 85 significance threshold, it's an unknowable thing because it doesn't, no one knows what the right thing is to do and you, you we actually cannot know that. Uh, we should not get hung up. Some of the people who, comp who talk about when I give this presentation, they say, well, but this, it, we, this stuff we don't know. And it's, you know, it's not black and white what you're saying and I'm, you're right. But we have to use the best available evidence that we have. And we shouldn't care who the, is the driver of change. Uh, the lab values are, th they've known this for decades, and they're not making big changes in the way they present lab reports. They have, I have heard them tell me, well, we're pretty sure healthcare providers know this. Mm, no. I teach lots of healthcare providers, and they, some of them know a little bit about this, but not a lot. Uh, we shouldn't, uh, the fact that we report bone densities in standard deviations is insanity. I mean, it, I don't understand standard deviations. I don't know how patients or you guys are supposed to. We should just be presenting results in ways that people can understand, not with error bars and levels of significance. Of course, we should uh, some, uh, discuss the variability or the exceptions to the, exceptions to the rules. And we need to be OK with ballparking. And I think mu much of your day should be spent ballparking and estimating and those sorts of things. And I don't, uh, whether or not this 
issue about lab values improves or worsens outcomes, it doesn't really matter to me. We should just be doing it because it's the right thing to do. And a lot of people have sometimes said when I talk to lab people, ah, it's the other lab's problems. No, it's all of our problems. And so we need to figure this out. So if I was the boss of lab result reporting, this is what I would be saying. We should be using ballpark estimates. We should always provide the imprecision. So you should always get a result back and it should always give you that imprecision. I'm going to show you the tables you can use that you don't need because the lab won't, will not do this that you can use. Uh, we should provide, lab people should provide much more definitive guidance on this. I said before, stop using terms like low, medium, high, or significant because they're relatively meaningless. If you are given a risk factor, I hope you almost never talk to people about their LDL level, their glucose number, or their blood pressure without saying, yeah, ignore that. What we're going to talk about is cardiovascular risk. Yes, I know that's a number. We just use that to help frame roughly what your risk is. Please do that as part of your practice. And do not do a test without discussion of a pretest probability and then a post-test probability. So don't just do a test for the sake of doing a test. Understand what you think the problem is in the first place, the probability bit, and how it would change if I got a test result back. And I think we mainly just need to make, make more tests inconvenient to do because it's so easy. Well, we just do all of them. And because they're on a sheet, we check, 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 check. Remember, you do 15 tests, there's at least a 50-50 chance one of them's gonna be abnormal. So it's all about presentation of the results. That's pretty gruesome, eh? That's kind of fun. So it's how we best present these things. We should not use any of these sort of terms. I don't even know if we should give you an exact number because it's, it's giving you the suggestion that it's precise. I don't think that'll ever happen in my career time where they'll say, no, we're not gonna tell you the number. Because we're humans, we want numbers. But this is the ballpark RCV. This is the percent change that you need to see in a lab test before you can be comfortable, whatever that means, that it's actually changed. So here's some just kind of interesting example. Look at LDL right here. So LDL has to change somewhere between 20 to 40 percent before you can actually say it's changed. Not that your treatment did it, or it just before you can say it's changed. Uh, total cholesterol is 10 to 20 percent. Look at some of the, look at iron and things like folate. Vitamin D is plus or minus 40 to 60 percent. If it hasn't changed that much, you can comfortably say, I don't think it's, or I don't know if it has changed. Some of them are chloride, sodium, malate. Those are pretty good, plus or minus 5 percent, because there's not much biologic variation in that. But bone density, 5 to 10 percent. Uh, you know, white blood count, plus or minus 20 to 40 percent. So even if it goes up 10 percent or down, all you can say is probably just biologic vari- or we can't rule out biologic variation. And then if you really want, this is the table that you sort of need to take home and think about. And once you've looked at this a few times, you'll get comfortable knowing what the variation is, is the first line right here for these common tests are, this is the approximate plus or minus range for a single measurement. So when you get a testosterone level or whatever, you get a point estimate and all you can say is it's plus or minus 15 to 30 percent around that number. And then the magnitude of the change is kind of what I said on that last one is that's the change you need to see before you can comfortably say we're pretty sure it's changed. You can't say it's changed by that amount. You can just say it's, it's probably gone up or it's probably gone down. And uh, what else? Yeah. So. And this again is on the handout that you, that you guys were given. This is just an example of the synopsis of what I just showed you with the bone density stuff showing how, th how much things change and how big those changes need to be before you can comfortably say that there's been a change. So, and these are very common tests that you guys would be routinely doing. So I'm just gonna show you one more example of, of what these, the, the issues are. <coughs> I started off with a tape measure. So, Let's assume this guy is six foot tall. I have a heightometer, also known as a tape measure. What change in height can you pick up if this heightometer RCV was this? So if my tape measure had an RCV of 2%, I could pick up whether this guy was somewhere between five foot 11 and six foot one. That's chloride, sodium, and osmolality. If the RCV was 5%, I can pick up if this guy's height has changed or uh, he's somewhere between five foot 10 and six foot two. When I get that 
sort of albumin, although they're a little bit higher up than that, RCV of 10%. Now we've got a test that I can go, well, he's somewhere between five foot nine and six foot three. If it's RCV of 20%, which is a lot of the lab tests that you see, the best estimate I can make, I think you're somewhere between five and a half and six and a half feet tall. When you get to these things, eh, you're somewhere about here to here. That's the variability that we're talking about. And then it gets there. Basically, I, I have no, I'm not even sure if you're human. I can't even test that now with this ruler. It's somewhere, you're somewhere between four and a half and seven and a half feet tall. <laughs> when it's so much better, you just look at the person and look at, yeah, but you're about six foot tall, I would imagine. And like I said, it gets ridiculous. So I, I mentioned to you guys that these hieroglyph, it's just uh, this, you, you gotta understand how to read these lab tests. And if I was doing this, this is the way it would look. That's my mother. This is the way I would like the lab test to be put out. And I would say, it should say, because of lab test and human variation, lab test results can only be provided within a range. That would be the first step to get people to go, huh, I just thought it was exact. And then the way I would do it is this. I would say your true results are likely somewhere in the range indicated by the yellow strip. So if it was white blood cells, and they were, that's the, the range that you have, the reference base that we use, the light blue is where normal is, and that on the outside is that abnormal, even those are the wrong words to use. And I would say, if these are the lab measurements, you're somewhere in that yellow area. And you can see if those yellow areas do not overlap, if they do overlap, they're probably not, we can't really say that they're different. But if they don't overlap, we're pretty comfortable that one is different than the other. So the same with potassium. Now it's a, it would be a smaller change because the variation is smaller. And then with H, uh, A1C, I would not even put it into a threshold thing. I would just say, this is the measurement, that's the variation, and put it into some sort of risk estimation process. So that blue line deals with the reference interval that I talked to you about at the beginning. The yellow deals with that analytic and human variability. And the overlap deals with that reference change values. And so I think, uh, and then the uh, color thing sort of talks about the, the risks and so on. So that's some of the issues associated with it. The one table I gave you at the end, I think if you have a look at that for any of the lab tests that you're getting, and look at the variation, you'll eventually, it won't take long to remember them. And it's again, it's ballpark estimates. So I'm more than happy to answer, try to answer any questions that you have, and I hope it was sort of interesting. Uh, it sure, when I, when I went through this, it changed somewhat the way I was thinking about these sorts of tests. And it helps me interpret the lab tests for people and not get people all bent out of shape. So any questions or nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath, diarrhea, constipation? 